Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Rachel Rosenthal. I'm the founder and editor in chief of the New Inquiry. And um, this panel is on publishing in the digital age. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists from your left to your right. Is that correct? Um, um, on the far end is Anna Cecilia Alvarez. She's a writer living in Brooklyn. She is the online editor of Adult Magazine. Her words on art and feminism have appeared in the New Angry Days and Rise Up. Matthias Klang explores the ways in which technology regulates us and the ways we attempt to control technology. In particular, he's fascinated with how technology impacts our rights. Matthew Clare is a PhD student in sociology at Harvard University. And Joseph Satton is a master's student at liberal studies at the New School for Social Research. Also, one of my students um, and Angela Chen, over here is our hashtag moderator. She is a Wall Street Journal reporter, an editor at the Morning News, and also a business manager, whatever title we've come up with for you, at the New England. Um, and so um, I'm, we'll get right to it for 15 minutes for each person. Um, I'm going to encourage all of you to ask your questions via the hashtags, and then Angela can, as the hashtag mod, sort of distill that, and we can get to a lot of your questions. Um, but if you come up with something, you know, once we're in the Q&A period, please line up the mic behind Angela, um, and we'll get to you. Um, so without further ado, Anna Cecilia. Hi, my name is Anna, like we said. Um, one click. Um, quick correction. I was bad at naming this talk. I don't know why I put Tumblr in the title, but I'm not going to be talking about Tumblr at all. So sorry, sorry to disappoint you if you were hoping for that. Um, but I will be talking about feminist discourse within digital publishing. Um, so the opening questions that I want to pose is first, how does feminist discourse operate within various digital content platforms, both editorial and social? And what are the socioeconomic and racial implications of where feminist discourse is published and monetized? Um, and I want to make a quick disclaimer when I use the word, I'm going to use it pretty loosely, the word feminist here, but I don't really mean or imply a static historical category or um, a stable set of ideologies. I'm kind of just using it to describe a specific type of content that I've seen populate a lot of blogs within the past decade. Um, and I'm imagining here things like what you read on the Jezebel, Hairpin, Exo Jane, etc. Um, like feminist think pieces, which I think we can all understand what that might mean. And then even within social media exchanges, um, I'm thinking here like feminist Twitter war. So again, we kind of that's kind of what I'm referring to. Um, so I first started thinking about this in terms of branding. I wrote about how certain um, mainly beauty companies use feminism or appeal towards feminist ethics, if you will, and use everything but the word to sell products. Um, behind me are two examples of two ads. The top one by Pantene, and they had a shampoo ad that kind of talked about um, like double standards that women face. Um, the bottom one is by this ad from Dove that appealed toward kind of like body image questions. So I kind of saw that um, these corporations were kind of appealing towards feminism in a way that I felt kind of failed because people could pretty easily see that what they were selling was maybe not compatible with what they were trying to propose. Um, but then even one step further, I kind of saw that the reason why this idea that's not really even that clear of feminism became a potential marketing scheme was because um, media companies were making it um, something that could be called like a trending topic. Um, and this happens within, again, blogs that, like I mentioned before, um, Jezebel being the most <coughs> obvious, that propose a certain like feminist editorial view, if you will. Um, and then even within different articles. This is a really interesting example. Um, this article appeared in Glamour, and it was an interview with Anna Holmes, who was the former editor-in-chief of Jezebel, on a new book that she had released. It was called like the Encyclopedia of Lady Things, whatever that is. Um, and you can see by the title, you know, the new dude calling himself a feminist. And the idea here is really interesting is that feminism becomes um, something that's cyclical, that's trending, that can be achieved through consuming or, um, you know, or, or aligning yourself in a certain way. 
um, that almost mirrored other type of um, beauty or fashion pieces in these publications. Um, so I you know, wrote this article kind of critiquing this and, and um, pointing towards it, but I kind of had a moment a couple months after I started a job at this company called Women in the World, um, which was its own digital publication, and they're kind of more like TEDx women. They make conferences that um, appeal towards a privileged set of women who pay a lot of money to go see other women, tell inspiring stories about being a woman. Um, and I was, I first asked to do social media and then asked to kind of populate the site with content and eventually started making advertorial content for Toyota, which is their um, largest sponsor. This you can't see it, but I kind of wrote this little piece about this very like nice looking lady who ran, runs like a nonprofit in DC. Um, but it kind of got me thinking about how, how I made my salary within this, you know, how women in the world made its money. Um, and kind of these two ways, I think broadly, that digital publications monetize their content. The first is, we all know, through ad impressions that the more time someone visits the site, the more money a site will get from its advertisers. That may or may not be totally right. Um, but it kind of is the reason why we see all these clickbait ads, like things people just want to make you visit the site so they get profit. And then the second is advertorial content, like we see here, where the corporation actually buys into the form of content production that the publication might um, create or produce and then kind of insert themselves really prominently. Um, so I was basically working within this. Um, and oh, well, one other note I want to also add with that. Um, even outside of editorial publications, social media platforms also make money in a similar way. Um, specifically Twitter, which I will talk about in a second. Um, they make, it's not that much, like a tenth of a penny every time you refresh your, um, your like time or like your newsfeed. Um, that's how they best measure how people are engaged. But the idea is that even social media sites do kind of profit from people visiting and refreshing and using their platforms continuously. So this obviously might want them to create either conversations or content that will get people to visit a lot. Um, and you know, I think, and this is sort of, so I have, I have this moment of like, okay, so I'm writing about how brands use this, but what I'm really doing as a writer and as a digital media coordinator um, isn't much different. You know, I'm using this vague set of ideas to sell something. Um, as a writer, I'm branding myself as some sort of expert or like a voice within this. Um, so I really had a question, you know, like, I, I kind of originally had thought as a writer that, you know, and I think this has been disproven now pretty well, that blogs or, or the internet would be something that might bring in more voices because you kind of surpass traditional forms of publishing. You don't have to go, you don't have to publish a book through a house, but now you can have a blog and people will visit your blog and read it. Um, but I think we have kind of have seen at this point that in fact, um, it doesn't happen, but I think in the race to monetize this content, the same socioeconomic stratification that applies in real life gets reproduced on the internet in the same way. So, so I think all these things, and I had to ask myself first, um, how does being a woman writing about feminism in a popular lady blog compared to a company producing gender aware ethics in its advertisements, to a website using feminist discourse as clickbait scheme, or to a person with a Twitter account creating a hashtag? Um, and even more interestingly, what, something that I couldn't really, I was curious about, like what about feminist discourse, this thing that seems, um, in a sense, maybe contradictory and, and, and conflicting with, um, well, this arguable, maybe it isn't, but ideally it would be something that would not be so easily sold. Um, but why can, is it so compelling by market standards within digital publishing, especially when digital publishing seemed to not, it didn't seem to be any more liberatory or, um, or I would say appealing to a feminist discourse than you would hope. So why is it? And then I kind of thought of to, what's coming up next? Oh, we'll go back. Um, I kind of realized that there was these two different, and I call them feminist discursive tropes that I saw happened in like the stereotypes about how people think about feminism that actually applied really well to digital publishing. The first is this thing called, I call it militant journalism, 
And this is what I kind of call like the feminist thing piece. So I think when people have an, a, like a stereotypical idea of like what was feminist discourse in the 70s, it's, you know, the, the word militant comes up a lot. It's very angry, it's reactionary, um, it's um, pissed off, you know, you get the pissed off, angry feminist. And this actually also happens to be what I feel writers are asked to do. You're asked to be outrage machines. You're asked to be immediately responsive and opinionated and reactionary. And it makes for pretty good, um, it makes for pretty good traffic because already, like we said, I think these, this feminist discourse is pretty indefinable and leaves room for commentary and for disagreement and for engagement. Um, so one kind of way that I saw this happen is the idea of like militant journalism. So like these angry, like feministy, opinionated think pieces that happen to work really well um, as content. And the second is this, I call it like the live through this um, personal essay piece, which is like women, this is like HuffPo women, basically all the content. So these are people who, or women who write about their personal experiences and then appeal to like a broad general kind of takeaway. And this seemed to me very reminiscent of consciousness raising conversations that were also very um, frequent in what is kind of like the stereotypical idea of feminism in the 70s, like women getting in a room and talking about their lives and then coming to this kind of larger conclusion about like the systematic oppression. Um, so this also makes for you know a very like easy content package of like a woman sharing her story. Um, so, and then, well, so that's one point. So we can see how feminist discourse, even though it's undefinable and antagonistic potentially to being like marketable content, in fact, when we look at these kind of discursive tropes works really well. Um, but I think the key then to remember is that of course, not everyone who creates content that employs feminist discursive tropes gets compensated. Um, they're much like historically, as we have seen, um, voices of women of color or queer women um, might quickly, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna really go through this. Um, so I'll say this in a sentence, basically, only women who might look like myself might get the chance to be able to write these militant journalism pieces within blogs, but other women of color who do talk about gender or other similar topics um, and do so mainly on Twitter um, might you know, do that as well, but don't get paid for it. And that's kind of the key, that their voices remain margin marginal and they remain economically unviable. Um, and this, so this is kind of, is re referencing this article that was written by Michelle Goldberg, who was um, an editor for The Nation, and she talked about toxic Twitter feminism, about how a lot of the narrative, or like the language by feminists within Twitter was um, toxic or angry, and then kind of the response was, of course, one that was admittedly pissed off, because they were saying, you know, we wish we could get paid to write nice long pieces for the nation, but in fact our only mode and our only access to this discourse is through Twitter. Um, and then it created this really gross kind of like incomplete guide to feminist infighting that people kind of were looking at this like conflict between women on Twitter. Um, and then I'll conclude by saying that what did I take away from this? I quit my job at Women in the World. It felt really good. Um, I no longer really try to write feminist think pieces. I instead try to, or I appeal to people to hire these women of color to write them for themselves. And I will say that I do think, even though I kind of have chosen to not really partake in this anymore, I feel like, if anything, hashtag feminism, which does, in one sense, can be you can argue reductive, I think in fact appeals to the very cool things about consciousness raising in that people share their personal experiences with something and then you see how it in fact is like a systematic larger issue. And I will end with that. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. <laughs>
kind of three things I want to talk about today. Um, one, I want to try to define this term, the think piece. Um, it's kind of this uh, amorphous term. It's thrown around a lot. It's become kind of a cliche. Um, but I want to try to uh, pin down exactly what it is, or at least what I think it is. Um, two, I want to try to scratch under the surface a little bit and try to look at some of the unstated theoretical assumptions that the think piece makes when it does what it does, um, and also ask if we agree with those assumptions. <clears throat> I'm going to say sometimes yes, other times maybe not as much. Um, and third, I want to point towards what a different kind of think piece might look like with a more robust or comprehensive set of assumptions. Okay. I'm just going to read from the iPad here. In the last few years, the so-called think piece has become one of the most recognizable, shareable, and influential forms of written content online. The think piece in its most general form, and here's the definition I'm kind of throwing out, is a piece of writing that responds to a recent cultural product, event, or phenomenon and attends specifically to its social or political implications. Though nearly anything can be the topic of a think piece, one of the most popular subjects, and the one I'm going to be talking about today, is the realm of entertainment or popular art, that is, music, TV, film, etc. The think piece is an intrinsically critical form of writing. More often than not, it's finding, analyzing, and critiquing problems. The key word of the think piece is, in this respect, the word problematic. This has also kind of <laughs> become a cliche. Let's roll with it. Um, usually what the think piece finds to be problematic is the way that people are represented or not represented within the world of the TV show, song, music video, or film. Race and gender are two of the biggest topics of the think piece, and with good reason. In the largely homogenous, uncritical, straight white male dominated world of mass entertainment, racial and sexual representations are often problematic indeed. Women, people of color, and other historically marginalized groups are frequently either depicted in ways that reinforce negative stereotypes or are otherwise not depicted at all. In many ways, the think piece acts as a bridge between art and society, treating certain aspects of a song or TV show as having real social impact and treating them seriously. So a few of the most think pieced cultural products of the last few years have been HBO's hit TV show Girls, came up in the last presentation, for its severe lack of diversity in casting, despite taking place in the extremely diverse city of New York. Robin Thicke's hit song Blurred Lines, for treating the issue of sexual consent as if it were ambiguous or blurry territory. And Miley Cyrus's infamous performance at the <laughs> 2013 MTV Video Music Awards for appropriating a historically black dance move while also populating her stage with black dancers in a way that critics viewed as dehumanizing, some even calling it a form of modern minstrelsy. That last example is what initially caused me to start thinking seriously about the contemporary think piece as its own unique form of writing with its own particular set of assumptions. A few days after the bulk of the critical backlash, which I think was generally insightful and helpful, a friend shared an opinion with me that took me by complete surprise. When the topic of Cyrus's performance came up, my friend had just one thing to say, and it didn't have anything to do with politics. It's bad art. What surprised me about this opinion was not the opinion itself, which I think many people probably shared, but the mere fact that I hadn't yet heard anyone make this claim about the performance, or indeed any claim at all about the performance's specifically artistic quality, such as it was. The sphere, in which the, the sphere in which the performance was being discussed online was purely social and political. Many think pieces had called the performance problematic. None that I knew of seemed to be simply calling it bad. This thought opened up a whole new string of questions for me about the Miley Cyrus performance in particular, but also about the relationship between art and politics today more generally. The most obvious question was this. Did it really even matter whether the performance was artistically good or bad, considering its profound political problems? In other words, didn't these problems cancel out whatever artistic merit the performance might have had? To some extent, isn't political badness almost equivalent to artistic badness today? The answer to these questions seemed to be yes, but attempting to answer them necessarily led to an even more fundamental question. What exactly is the relationship between political content and artistic quality more generally? 
Are they simply two sides of a scale, one outweighing the other depending on the circumstances? Or is there perhaps a more complicated relationship between the two? This string of questions, in turn, opened up further questions about the think piece itself and the assumptions it makes about the objects it studies. Shortly after the dust from the Miley Cyrus performance had settled, philosopher and critic Robin James, writing on the Cyborgology blog, offered a very helpful articulation of this problem, one that inspired the idea for this paper. Her post was on the concept of coincidental consumption, a term recently introduced by James and Nathan Jurgensen to describe the way that the substance of online content often becomes coincidental to, or less important than, its shareability through social media. James gives the example of sharing an article without really reading it first, a practice I'm sure many of us are familiar with, <laughs> and turning her attention to the think piece centered backlash to a racially problematic Lily Allen music video, James took the notion of coincidental consumption one step further to describe how the think piece, itself a part of the sharing economy, makes certain elements of music and music videos coincidental to others. James writes, what I want to think about is the coincidental role of music in the contemporary music industry. It seems like so many, or it seems like music videos and or performances are increasingly common fodder for so-called think pieces, but what's interesting to me is that most of these think pieces discuss the social and political implications of songs and videos without talking about the actual music, as though music was somehow separable from the social and political work these songs and videos accomplish. We need to think very carefully about what gets lost, what's obscured, when we focus exclusively on the visual and lyrical content of these music videos and performances. So even though performances, songs, TV shows, and music videos are at some level artistic forms, the think piece tends to ignore their specifically artistic qualities. Whatever the actual relationship between the political and artistic elements in a work of art, the think piece at the very least assumes that they are separable from one another and further that the artistic qualities are coincidental to the social and political qualities. The question is, do we agree with that assumption? Truth be told, the Miley Cyrus performance probably isn't the best example to think through this deep problem. Performances at the Video Music Awards are rarely appraised in terms of their artistic merit these days. So maybe the question of artistry was indeed irrelevant, and the think pieces were correct in treating it as such. They were, after all, extremely effective in elevating the discourse around the performance and changing people's minds about it. In other words, the think pieces did their job. Other media in which the artistic side is clearly less important than the political side also receive fruitful treatment from think piece interventions. The TV commercial, for example, or the political speech. But what about other art forms that we do take seriously as art and from an artistic perspective, things like music more generally or as of the last few years, the TV show? These same questions of the connection between political content and artistic form pop up constantly in those media as well and rarely in as clean cut a way as with the Miley Cyrus performance. Consider, for example, the response to Kanye West's most recent album, Yeezus, which was equal parts praise for musical brilliance on the one hand and criticism for politically problematic lyrics on the other hand. Or take HBO's recent hit show True Detective, nearly universally praised for its writing, acting, and cinematography while also being chastised for its flattening and marginalization of female characters. Girls, one of my examples from earlier, also fits this profile since it's seen much critical acclaim, including two Golden Globes and several Emmy, Emmy nominations, in spite of its diversity issues. In these examples, the question of the relationship between political progressiveness and artistic quality becomes much more difficult. Do we give art a pass for being problematic if it's great art? Or do political problems always outweigh artistry? Or perhaps, as I suggested earlier, are the issues of political and artistic value connected in a more complex way, such that we can't just weigh one side against the other? These seem to be pretty important questions to our understanding both of art and politics today. But the think piece, with its focus squarely on politics, doesn't seem to answer these questions, or even to begin to ask them. A reasonable question to ask at this point is simply whether the theoretical limitations, what I argue were the theoretical limitations, of the think piece even matter. Perhaps the think piece is good at what it does, identifying problematic elements in artworks and explaining why they're harmful, and it need not do any more than that. After all, that seems to be a pretty important political project on its own. I want to respond to that objection in a somewhat roundabout way by contrasting the think piece with an even more popular genre of writing about art, 
traditional arts criticism, most commonly encountered in the form of the review. Though the think piece and the review both address ostensibly artistic products, their approaches to these products could not be more different. If the think piece assumes that the artistic is coincidental to the political, the review assumes the exact opposite, that the political is coincidental to, and therefore less important than, the artistic. Put another way, if the think piece concerns itself mostly with, political, if, with the political content of the artwork, the review concerns itself mostly with artistic form. The review is primarily concerned with how well made the album or TV episode is, usually not dwelling much on social implications. It cares about how the song sounds, how the film is acted and shot, how the book reads. If the key critical term of the think piece is the word problematic then, the key critical term of the review, the same one used by my friend who hated the Miley Cyrus performance, is just the word bad. I think this is a useful comparison because the think piece and the review each make a competing claim about what we should pay attention to in a work of art and what we can safely ignore. They each make a claim, in other words, about the very purpose of art today. The think piece, quite reasonably, wants art to be fair and just. The review, equally reasonably, wants art to be artistically excellent. So maybe ask yourselves the question, which of these do you want from art today? What side are you on? The side of the think piece or the side of the review? Of course, when we put the question this way, the idea that we must choose one option or the other starts to seem ridiculous. My answer, and I assume the answer of many of you, is to reject the question itself. We want both political fairness and artistic excellence. Political progressiveness without artistic quality doesn't seem much worth pursuing. Just think about Macklemore, for example. And artistic quality without political fairness seems plainly unjust. Looked at this way, the question of whether we agree with the theoretical assumptions of the think piece becomes secondary to whether it, as a form of criticism putting certain demands on art, is making its case as comprehensively as it could be. If we want art that is not just politically just but also artistically exceptional, I would argue that our critical writing will be the most effective if it demands both of these things at once by trying to understand how they're connected to one another. My question from earlier. Perhaps we shouldn't consider the political to the exclusion of the artistic as the think piece does, or even on the other hand, consider the artistic to the exclusion of the political as the review does. Rather, a truly comprehensive arts criticism, somewhere in between the think piece and the review, will seek to figure out how these competing dimensions of the artwork, so often in tension with one another, might in fact work together. Thank you. This will be easier. All right. Over the past 40 years, uh, two major changes have unfolded in our economy. Uh, Ronald Reagan is one of those major changes. So since the 70s, um, an ideology that we commonly know as neoliberalism has come to dominate the way politicians, policymakers, and everyday citizens come to think about the role of the government um, in the market and in everyday life. This ideology, first propagated by Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, economists at the Chicago School, has justified spending, government spending cuts, the decline of labor unions, individual responsibility, the infallibility of the free market, and allocating goods and the like. The second major change has been the increasing importance of knowledge and information in our economy, most notably the increasing use and scope of digital and communication technologies in disseminating, regulating, and producing this knowledge through the internet social media, digital devices, and digital production systems. So many theorists have asked whether or not these two phenomena are related, and if so, how are they related? 
So most theories considering the relationship between neoliberalism and the increasing use of digital technologies posit a mutually constituted relationship. So influential work on the information society, the network society, and digital capitalism tells us that digital technologies allow neoliberal capitalism to operate more efficiently. Most of this work, however, is concerned with the use of digital technology in firms, businesses, and other economic contexts where the goal is to maximize profit and always has been to maximize profit. So of course digital technologies would be employed for market purposes in these contexts. But what about in the art world? Um, a context that's often considered quite anti-economic. Are digital technologies used for capitalist purposes in these contexts? Um, in other words, what can the use of digital technologies in the art world tell us about the general relationship between digital technologies on one hand and neoliberalism on the other? So some work, um, actually a pretty significant uh, literature on cultural industries or creative industries, has begun to consider how digital technologies in particular are used in cultural production. The difficulty, again, with this work, however, is that most of it tends to focus on, artis on artistic and cultural production in expressly economic contexts. So these are the more commercial uh, types of artistic production that tend to be more for mass enjoyment. So that's the film industry, the music industry, major book publishers, um, and these two are, of course, business ventures. So to consider the relationship between digital technologies and neoliberalism in non-economic contexts, um, and in the non-economic art world, I consider the internet blogs, how the internet blogs and social media and online tracking systems are used by editors and writers in the avant-garde literary field. So instead of looking at profit-driven uh, sort of literary creators like GQ Magazine or the New York Times and how they use digital technologies, I instead look at how avant-garde literary magazines or small presses and journals employ these technologies. So unlike in profit-driven industries, it would be surprising if these avant-garde magazines and journals use digital technologies in neoliberal or market-driven ways, um, because historically these magazines have been considered autonomous uh, or uninterested in economic gain. So the avant-garde literary world is supposed to be where art is done for art's sake. Writers and editors are thought to be more concerned with accumulating symbolic capital such as prestige or recognition or just respect and honor, rather than economic capital. And I mean, this is the world in which best-selling authors are sort of considered uh, ridiculous, right? You don't want to be that best-selling author who has an amazing amount of commercial success. You'd rather be this sort of striving artist. So to be avant-garde, uh, according to numerous theorists like Bourdieu and Becker, um, is to be anti-capital. And so I asked whether or not this is still the case uh, in, 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 in a world in which there's increasing digitalization of this avant-garde literary field. So to assess the relationship between digital technologies and neoliberalism in the avant-garde literary field, I asked two major questions. One is how do social actors in the avant-garde literary field engage with digital technology? And second is what is the relationship between the use of these digital technologies in the avant-garde literary field and what I define as neoliberal cultural practices? So importantly, instead of defining neoliberalism as a sort of coherent, homogenous ideology of policymakers and political elites, I look at more like something like akin to neoliberal subjectivities, right? So neoliberal cultural practices in our everyday way of operating, whether or not we're at work or in our everyday lives. And so to answer these questions, uh, my analysis assesses the extent to which editors and writers in particular um, of literary magazines use neoliberal cultural logics or apply them in their conceptualization of how they use certain digital technologies such as social media, online tracking systems, and the like. So, Specifically, I focus on whether or not writers and editors employ five logics that I've sort of inductively identified as uh, these logics that sort of constitute the neoliberalism that academics tend to write about. So within academia, obviously, anthropologists, economists, sociologists have all written about neoliberalism. And so I've identified five uh, logics that they tend to talk about. So the first is entrepreneurship. This logic values the freedom and liberty of the individual in the marketplace. It specifically values the freedom of the individual to work when, how, and to what extent he or she prefers for his or her own material gain. The second logic is what I term market faith. This logic places faith in the economic market as a rational institution that allocates prices efficiently, often in opposition to the government. In uncertain times, faith in the market often translates into a fear of the market and its state. The third is profit maximization. This logic insists that any product, whether material or symbolic, should be placed in the marketplace 
and should be priced in such a way as to maximize the economic profit that the seller receives from the product. The fourth that I identify in the literature is what I term efficiency. So this logic values the fastest and cheapest production, promotion, and distribution of any product, as well as efficient modes and technologies of production. And it tends to be concerned with balancing the quality of the product uh, with the speed and cost of its production. And the final logic is what I term egocentricity. You could call this individualism. This logic values the individual over the community. It values the accumulation of individual forms of capital, often at the expense of community or global concerns. And so in order to assess whether or not these logics are prevalent when writers and editors are talking about their, how they use digital technology, I interviewed editors of literary magazines, small presses, and small anthologies. So all of my respondents considered themselves to be writers in addition to editors. And in addition to their editorial positions, they often hold other jobs, such as working at restaurants and things like that. And of course, this is to be expected. As a lot of theory on the avant-garde world says, obviously, these people don't make much money from their production of their magazines, so they'll obviously have to have other jobs. In my analysis, though, I draw an important distinction between what I term entrepreneurial editors. And so these are people who sort of established their own magazines, especially when digital technologies became prevalent and they could go online and uh, start websites. And then what I term just editors. So regular editors who work for older magazines that were established in the 20th century. These, these magazines were like the Paris Review, Granta Magazine, uh, the Kenyan Review, things like that. So I also conducted field work um, over the past year, and I conducted content analysis of the conference program, the, the Association of Writers and Writers Programs. Uh, it's also known as AWP for short. And uh, I just wanted to do this in order to see how and when writers and editors talk about digital technology on panels, things like that, and then also to look at their program. So if we look at their program, um, what I did uh, from 2006 to 2013, I looked at their program. This is an example of a listing in the, in the conference program. So this event listing obviously reveals that you know, some writers and editors do use digital technology in neoliberal ways. They talk about it in neoliberal ways. Here we see that writers are encouraged to, quote, use new media, to, quote, market themselves, drawing on neoliberal logics of entrepreneurship and efficiency. This is not the classic way that theorists or people generally have talked about how avant-garde people think about themselves or think about their cultural production. So as we can see from this table, uh, the language in the previous slide is not rare. Many of the events at AWP talk about how writers can use digital technology in quite neoliberal ways, and such language has increased in the program over time. So from 2006 to 2013, the number of events that mentioned digital technologies rose from 1% of the AWP program to 8%. This is just raw numbers, this isn't percentages. And events that use neoliberal language increased from 5% of all events in 2006 to 7% of all events in 2013. Moreover, the coupling between talking about digital technologies and talking about neoliberal cultural logics is tighter in 2013. So this suggests that much of the increase in the language around neoliberalism in the conference program is somehow related to language around digital technology. So as we'll see from the interview data in the next few slides, uh, we'll see a clearer picture of how and when uh, these editors talk about the use of digital technology. And in some cases, uh, they do draw on neoliberal logics, but in other cases, they sort of uh, fight back against certain neoliberal logics. So there's strong evidence that the use of digital technology is associated with the logic of entrepreneurship among entrepreneurial editors in my sample, as we might expect. One editor told me that he started an online journal because he wanted to take a different approach from extant literary magazines. Another editor drawing on an entrepreneurial logic of valuing the freedom and independence of owning a small press told me that he'd like the small press to become a, quote, part-time job. And in order to do that, he needed to focus on making his website more professional and continue to use print and on-demand technologies to keep his costs low. When talking about their personal writing, all of my respondents drew on the logic of entrepreneurship when discussing digital technology. So as one editor told me, it's important to have an active social media presence, which can, be par which can then be parlayed into a major book uh, deal. So digital technology enables writers and editors to freely market themselves, and it reduces the barriers to entry for people who start journals at a minimal cost. The simplicity of entry into the literary magazine field allows editors and writers to more easily commodify their artistic production, absent traditional institutional structures. However, many structures like large media companies, advertisers, and website hosting companies reap most of the economic profit. 
With regard to the logic of market faith, uh, in their discussion of digital technology, editors and writers do not really often draw on this logic. However, younger and entrepreneurial editors draw on this logic to varying degrees, especially when they're discussing their use of website analytics. So for example, one editor told me uh, about a column uh, on her website that had received 2,000 hits in two weeks. She told me that by being able to, quote, run the numbers on blog posts and stories, the editors at her journal can see what readers are interested in and then make future editorial decisions, such as soliciting certain writers or certain styles of writing based upon this data. But most editors that I interviewed told me that they would not change the fundamental direction of their journal in response to readership demand. So this editor um, at a pretty prestigious independent magazine told me that even though he will look at the subscription data and where people are coming from and what uh, sort of things they're more likely to read, he'll never change the content or curate the content in response to readership. Uh, so this is a little bit different than what we see mostly in journalism fields or less uh, restricted or more economic fields of cultural production. So the ultimate goal for uh, most editors who pay attention to online data is to figure out how to increase the prestige and readership of their magazines but not necessarily increase the revenue they receive. Still, editors tend to listen to readers and make some of their editorial decisions uh, based upon readership demand. The logic of profit maximization uh, also reveals a mixed picture. Some editors use social media updates and blog posts to not just draw in readers, but also to draw in paying customers. One editor, who's a pretty old guy, he was pretty explicit about the only reason why he uses a blog, and that's to get people to buy his magazine. But most editors are pretty nuanced or ambivalent, especially younger writers and editors. One editor told me that the purpose of Facebook and Twitter posts is to get people to read the magazine, not to get people to necessarily buy it. While she acknowledged an interest in selling copies as well, she said it's not like we have editors breathing down our necks. Another dismissed the idea entirely, saying that this is the world of literary magazines. Very few people read this stuff anyway. It's so niche, no one's going to buy it. <laughs> All respondents viewed digital technologies as a means through which their magazines could operate much more efficiently. A few quotations detail this finding. In some way, editors use digital technologies to cut costs in the production of creative work. For example, one editor noted that he used Twitter to recruit readers um, in, of submissions because it is quicker and he often gets people who are willing to work for free. In other ways, editors use digital technologies to efficiently keep track of submissions. Submission managers are often used to evaluate submissions with a quick up or down online evaluation rather than the old school method where editors sit around the table and wait until it comes through snail mail. So we see that digital technologies allow for the use of free labor uh, and they also allow for the quick production of a work of literature in this context. Finally, uh, often when we think about social media uh, and blogs, as pl we, we think about them as platforms for creating community online. In some sense, this is also true of writers and editors in literary magazines. On one hand, digital technologies can encourage communities of like-minded people, uh, writers and editors who cannot afford to attend conferences or don't live in New York. On the other hand, as writers and editors become much more established, they often use blogs and Twitter to promote themselves rather than to promote any sense of community. So I saw this mostly uh, in one of the uh, people I interviewed. Um, he's, a, he's a writer and an editor, uh, and he started out blogging and engaging with an online community of writers whom he thought matched his aesthetic taste. They were anti-New York, and he liked that. But as he continued engaging with the online community and uh, started becoming much more well-known, things changed. He found interacting with people in the online comment sections and over Twitter to be too time-consuming. People began asking him to blurb their books or to write short pieces uh, for them. And he told them, look, he told me rather, look, it's too overwhelming to interact with people online anymore. Sounds like a diva thing to say, but I just don't have time. So quickly, from my data, I find that there appears to be a relationship between the use of digital technologies such as Facebook, uh, website analytics, and other online submission managers. Obviously, this is mostly among the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial editors, but I argue that there's sort of a decrease in a barrier to entry because of these online digital technologies. So there's a new type of people with different types of logics entering the field. And uh, while digital technologies are often used in neoliberal ways, I also find that deal to, de, uh, digital technologies help editors to increase the prestige and symbolic capital, things that tend to be uh, constitutive of the avant-garde literary field. Really quickly, some implications. Uh, first is the theory on avant-garde autonomy. Um, these findings made the question of whether or not a lack of autonomy in the art world is necessarily a good or a bad thing and for whom, right? So uh, digital technologies tend to increase the income for people um, who inter interact with them. 
uh, and they're more willing to pay attention to readers, so readers have much more of a voice. However, in many in other instances, we see that digital technologies can encourage a self-promotion of uh, yourself over one's community, efficiency rather than consistent production, and the use of free labor. Uh, and second, these findings just generally have implications for how we should think about technology and neoliberals. And digital technology, as we all know, is variegated. There are many types and ways to use it. Um, and also neoliberalism itself is quite uh, heterogeneous and variegated. So thank you so much. to be here. It's been some very exciting days, which means, of course, every, for every day or every presentation, my slides have actually increased instead of decreased. So good luck on the timekeepers. Um, my job today, or my goal today, is to talk about the changes in, in the book market, but not from the market point of view, but rather from the technology point of view, and, the what's that, and what that does to both the market, the readers, and um, yes, basically culture. So easy, 15 minutes, right? Uh, without a clicker. Uh, but first of all, because I'm built that way, let's start with some history. The idea of culture as property or the copy as property going back to when, well, basically the Roman times, when you find people arguing about who owns what. This is basically an argu argument between two poets. Uh, Marshall or Martialis argued with Fidentius because Fidentius was stealing his poets, po poems, sorry. And basically, the book you are reading aloud is mine, Fidentius, but while you read so badly, it begins to be yours. Um, he also has some other little poems that where he basically says, if you don't want my stuff, just buy it, and it could be yours. The interesting thing here, of course, is he's talking about the content and being allowed to be represented as his content. It's not actually the copy of the book, it's the content. And of course, from this point, we get on and we have this wonderful discussion about plagiarism, which could take about another half an hour, but I'm not going to do that. Moving right ahead, and I am sort of skipping a couple of centuries here and there, uh, we get, uh, have to go to Ireland for the next step. Now, if you are copyright lawyers, which, by the way, I am, uh, most people say copyright law begins in England with the Statute of Anne, 1710, and we're going to get there, but don't worry. There's a part before which nobody tells you about, and it's basically two monks in Ireland, two abbots, actually. Uh, one abbot goes to visit another abbot. Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? Uh, one abbot goes to visit another abbot. And while there, he asks to borrow a book from the library. And the abbot goes, of course you are, you're my guest. And he secretly copies the book. And then takes the copy and leaves. Now, the first abbot, who had the original, says, hey, you can't make copies of my books. Does this sound familiar, by the way? Um, <laughs> and he says, well, of course I can. I have made a copy. It's my copy. Go away. It's mine. Um, they get very, very angry, and they go to the High King of Ireland. By the way, my history was really bad. You know, they had a High King of Ireland. And the High King of Ireland listens to the whole thing. goes, well, no. To every cow, it's calf, and to every book, it's copy. It's like, yeah, this is, we recognize this. This is basically, you know, copyright law today. But the abbot who stole the book said, no. Because he also believed in might is right. So basically, in 561 AD, he took his armies and met the other people's armies on the hill of, oh, Ben, 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 what is the B word there? I can never say that word in a hurry. And he kicked their asses. Thousands of people lay dead on the field, but he said, the copy's mine. So, yes, this is basically what Google does to copyright. We're bigger, we're stronger, we'll do what we want anyway. I come from Sweden, we have Pirate Bay there. We're small, we're tiny, we'll get our asses kicked. But they don't stop fighting, very annoying. Otherwise, theory would be so nice. All right, that was, then, of course, we have to jump up a bit more time when we start looking at the Enlightenment and the idea that, that we need more literature in society and actually producing more stuff is really good. And the only problem was that there were evil publishers who were basically stealing the good stuff of the authors and how do we prevent this? And this is where we all get into the Statute of Anne where basically they say, no, 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 evil publishers shouldn't be allowed to take any book, pay five pounds or whatever and then publish it forever. The ownership, the property of the book should end up with the author, of course, 
And since this is, of course, 1710, it's all about the reason for this. Um, for the purpose, well, uh, there you go. For the, yes, for the encouragement of learned men to compose and write useful books. There's no Garfield here. It's all about men and useful books. But of course, once you give lawyers a toy like this, you know they're not going to stop there. It can't be about men writing useful books. We've created property out of nothing. This is a magical moment. I come from a country where we, where we never even had the whole concept of registration. Basically, I write something, I hold it up to you, it's mine. That's magic, people. So this had to, of course, expand. It started expanding. And this maybe wasn't much of a problem, unless, of course, we don't take into consideration technology. Now, technology changes. Now, one of the major problems is, of course, that my slides are in the wrong order. But never mind that. Digitalization changes everything, because now everything is a copy. But you know, digitalization, I teach students about this, and they get really bored, because it's old school. They prefer a little more modern age, and I go, OK, look, computers. The computers are called the computing division of the computing department. No, they're not impressed either. Well, OK, look, my first com the first computer, the Holoreth machine, really exciting stuff, 1880. No, nobody's happy about that either. There you go, the first computer. <laughs> it's a long way from the iPad. It's a lovely story. You should look it up. Anyway, what really happens here, of course, is when we get to the next point where, where the web comes in. This is the opening of the English, the Olympics in London. And the presenter said, this is a term, Tim Berners-Lee. And said, don't worry about it. If you don't know his name, you can Google it. No, no you can't. If you didn't exist, you couldn't. Well, never mind. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it happened. It some time. OK. Um, basically, aside from creating a lot of things about cats, the uh, technology of the internet and the web made it possible for us to do things we hadn't been able to do before. And we were less reliant on the production. And we have wonderful new words like prosumer which is horrible, isn't it? But never mind. Uh, what has this all got to do with books? Well, you see, the boring technology which was happening alongside this started a long time ago. In 1934, Popular Mechanics said, in the future, we're going to read books from machines. And we're going to put on these wonderful coats and sit in armchairs and read e-books like that. <laughs> I still miss that point. But what really happened, of course, was in the last decades, with, from e-paper in the 1970s, which is like also boring. It's 1970s. You can't tell this to students. Um, we have, oh, do you, who remembers Newton? Yes, lovely people. It was hopeless. It was big. You, you really needed a little case, and it was really good. But it was the beginning of the e-book. And then, of course, you have the rocket book in 1999, where actually some really far-sighted visionaries would hold this up and go, look, I can read for 13 minutes. <laughs> and then I need a battery. Uh, this then, of course, developed. Kindle came along, and more importantly, of course, when Apple came over and held up something big and said, you want this phone. Do you remember the time before they did that, when everyone wanted the little phone? Wow, things have changed. OK, uh, then, of course, the iPad, where we have a discussion of what's happening with technology and what's not happening with technology. And all of a sudden, we start to change. We're providing our literature, our books, via our technology. Which is not really a big thing. It's kind of useful. This is the way we do it. But the shift, the subtle shift, which is really, really fun, it's the no copy thing. Content is licensed, not sold. So all of a sudden, my bookcase isn't my bookcase. I'm just sort of borrowing it or licensing it. And then this, this is like, yes, we've all seen this. But the fun part that's been happening in the, with books, and because books are old school and boring, nobody actually they don't really get that much publicity is the ways in which the publishing companies have been subtly, or, or rather unsubtly, trying to take control over our libraries. Some really fun examples, or horrific if you prefer them. I'm a lawyer, I like horrific examples because that means I get to do stuff. I'm a researcher, which means I prefer horrible examples. Um, you've probably heard these before. Uh, Amazon decided, because of co a copyright snafu, in other words, some little lawyer didn't check the copyright restrictions in Australia, Amazon had published uh, George Orwell's book. It had to be George Orwell, 1984, isn't it perfect? And they got it out on the Kindle, and everyone was happy. I mean, it can't be that many people who bought it, but never mind. And then we realized, oh, shit. So they decided, well, we'll just take it away. Flick a switch. Actually, not switch. It's probably digital, of course. And it was gone. And the notes that people had made in those books were gone. So, of course, they got new books. But the fact is that your copy, your dog-eared copy, which is digital, not dog-eared anymore, <coughs> is gone. And we realized, oh, whose library is it? Yeah, OK. That's not really important, I guess. 
My favorite one, of course, is, is Barnes & Noble, who, went, who in the height of the Kindle, Barnes & Nook Wars, decided the word Kindle was banned. And they read it as a so search and replace from the word Kindle. Uh, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> in the middle of a war and peace, a, a reader you know, was reading and said, it was as if, if a light had been nooked in a carved and painted lamp. <laughs> And he said, that doesn't make sense. I don't remember that. So he went to the thing that the original, he went to the paper copy. <laughs> ah, it was as if a light had been kindled, of course. So yes, so now we're actually going inside the text and making changes to text. We're actually, who is creating literature here? Problematic. And the, one of the most famous cases, of course, is the Norwegian case, which just should drive everyone mad. Uh, basically, a Norwegian user called, who's been identified as Lynn, and only Lynn. Amazing, social media, we only know her first name. Um, yes, good, fine, Oof, never, no problem. Uh, <laughs> she was suddenly, all her libraries, sorry, try that again. Suddenly, Lynn's access to her whole library was just gone. And she contacted Amazon and Amazon said, well, you violated copyright, uh, violated the, the terms of agreement. And she tried to ask how and said, never mind, that's just it. Uh, it just happened. Eventually, this became a more important thing. People started discussing it on different social media sites, and eventually it ended up on a forum at Amazon, and Amazon reinstated Lynn's uh, library. But the thing was, and Amazon still says, it's our right. You violate. We don't have to tell you what you've done. We can just take your library away from you. On a more easy level, this is happening in, in uh, university libraries almost everywhere. If we stop uh, paying for a subscription of one magazine, everything, the back catalogue, usually disappears, unless we've taken care of that in advance, which is very, very problematic. Pri previously, we'd at least have the paper copies that nobody wanted. Um, okay, the impact of culture in four minutes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, one of the wonderful things uh, is that I love the, the uh, I, oh, these words, iPad, pod, iPod classic. And you have, and they're on the marketing, on the web page, it says 40,000 songs you can have on that. And you go, wow, who has time to listen to 40,000 songs and how do you choose them? And they go, don't worry about it, shuffle. The thing is, when you do it with books, it's really confusing. How do you choose a book to read? Especially if it's a digital format. What do you do with covers? What do you do with design? So all these questions begin to appear. Previously, when you had one book, you went on vacation with one book, you go, oh, it's a crap book, I should have bought something else. But I'm in Greece now, they don't sell anything else but, you know, any but Greek books. So I'm stuck with this book. And you, you know, plow through the first 50 pages and realize, oh, it's not too bad. And you read the crap, sorry, yeah, you read the book, literature, great work. And uh, <laughs> now, of course, if you're carrying, what, 3,000 books in your, in your Kindle, why would you read more than half a page? And why would an author write in a way that takes you more than half a page to catch into the book and get started with the book. Culture is <laughs> changing. Okay, uh, information overload, that was part of it there. The next step, of course, is, well, how do we fill our books? And that's even more fun. Oh, saving our libraries, wrong order. Uh, saving our libraries, I'll do later, if I get to it. Uh, is, of course, how we do things, how we get things into our lovely lives. And this is a wonderful, I've done some of my research, has been on interviewing the book pirates, which are really fun. Uh, partly the, the whole way of how do you remove the digital rights management mechanisms from the books. Very, very easy. Make it simple, make technology easy, make it attractive. People do it and they start sharing. And all of a sudden you have things like Demonoid. This is the early Demonoid. It was taken down, Demonoid's back again. I like this slide because it has the really obvious uh, organized Kindle Mobile Library, 13,000 books. 13,000 books and you can't find anything good to read. All right, uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it creates a very interesting problem. Uh, it also creates an, a different way of looking at pirates and piracy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's when you get art, uh, uh, articles like this, you go, yes, thank you, and then you read the article, and apparently, <clears throat> older women in piracy means 35. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of scary. Uh, so basically, and then of course the last step that I want to talk to you about uh, before I get back to pre preserving the library, which I haven't really forgotten, is the piracy, uh, the piracy, privacy question. They're so close. The privacy question is really, really fun with books. They know which books I've bought. They know how far I've read in my book. They know if I've read the whole book or haven't read the whole book. They know what I've highlighted. They know what I've shared. I mean, these are, these are various things, of course. They know what I say I read. 
if I were looking at other parts of social media, and what I actually read. It's a very interesting world we're living in where people actually know what, they actually, what we actually say we're reading as opposed to, oh yes, I always carry Proust with me. So the privacy question. The preserving the library, which was of course slide in the wrong order, is more about um, what we do with our fabulous libraries when we die, basically. And of course these are technical questions and, and legal questions and we can solve them in a heartbeat, but there's no real interest. Who's going to solve this question? Well, the lawyers. But which lawyers? Well, the publishers and the uh, technology lawyers. Well, they're not interested in actually keeping our, our, our libraries. Our, our digital heritage is our own problem. So we have the whole tri idea, well, if I, tr if I die, here's the password to my Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> eh, yeah, it doesn't really have the sort of, here's my library. It doesn't have the same effect. Anyway, uh, 16 seconds. To sum it all up. <laughs> This is part of a larger research project I'm doing. These are the questions I've been asking. I've been going out and talking to people. I haven't done the methodology part and presented it to you because it's slightly more boring. What I want to do eventually is try to present all this in a larger form, in a dead tree format and then digital format. That's later on. And uh, well, thank you for listening. Yes, Creative Commons, pictures, slides, there. Good. Um, thank you. I'm going to start with a really quick poll. Angela, how many questions did we get? About three. About three, okay. Show of hands, how many people here have a question to ask? One, okay. Thank you, okay. We might get more. Um, thank you all for your presentations. Um, we don't have much time for questions. I just want to make one quick remark. But it's really interesting that there was not, I mean, in this sort of panel, there's always some lip service to, you know, what's the future of print? And there was just no notion that that was a relevant question in this, these series of presentations, which I found interesting. Um, I'm gonna ask just one question and maybe get to more once everyone's had the chance to have the questions asked. Um, but it, this kind of goes to everybody. Um, I guess the one thing that seemed to link a lot of your papers was, this notion of contemporary, the contemporary identity of the content producer. So a lot of this is not about the consumer, but it's about you know, what sort of person is writing this, like militant journalism, live through this feminism, egocentricity, coincidental content. Like, you know, what, is, what are these digital structures doing to the personalities of the kinds of people that write? Um, and is it attracting a new kind of person or is it transforming people? I can take a stab. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard question. That's something that's uh, definitely come up a lot. I mean, when I'm doing my research, I try to trace with the person I'm interviewing, sort of, it's obviously their post justification of how they got to where they are. But it's interesting, uh, the last story of the guy who uh, sort of was transformed, right? I mean, he thought the internet and blogging was going to be a great way for him to get his name out. So in that sense, it seems like maybe, you know, there is a little bit of a selection effect, right? Where there are certain types of people who are more attracted to using the internet. Um, but then, yeah, I think the internet does maybe have an effect. I'm not a psychologist, but on your psychology, I mean, the guy was completely affected by how many people were responding to him, by the intensity of it. Uh, some of it was very negative. People that he would meet in person uh, after just interacting with them online, and then he just it was like, they're nothing like that. And, 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 and online, like, they were completely different. This guy, like, went by a different name in person. It's, uh, so it's interesting, but I don't want to be deterministic about it. I'm not sure because obviously I only interviewed 23 people. It's not representative in any way, but the people I interviewed, uh, it seemed like there was a little bit of a change. There are also changes coming in the way in which the author has to work. So if you're looking at online reviews, you want to uh, ensure you have an online review, and there are different ways of doing this. Several authors have been caught writing reviews for themselves. Uh, but more interesting, there's a now a rising business model where you actually pay for uh, five-star reviews on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And there's actually fixed prices for how much you pay. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of brings into a question, too, about who is able to make a living off of this content production. I agree that I think it's partly about um, there's a certain type of personality that can you know, muster the energy to live through blogging. It, that's, you know, I would call it mythology. Um, but also certain people, I think many people or many writers engage with digital content production, but only some could call it a vocation. Um, 
and there's a, a lot, obviously a lot of implications to who who gets to have it and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll also kind of close that. Great. Um, I guess I want to throw it to our hash mod to ask the questions that you guys asked on Twitter. Yeah, so it looked like most uh, of these questions. Do you want to <laughs> So it looked like most of the questions that I received were for Matthew and then his piece on digital technology. One um, was kind of about a definition. It was saying, you know, why are all indie mags seen as avant-garde? And kind of hoping you could address that. So should I read all three or? I'll read all three and then I think Matt can yeah. choose one. Um, and then the second one, um, which was received from a couple of people, is kind of about the idea that, you know, does marketing really always corrupt literature? And then kind of saying, should you publish to challenge readers or to give them the entertainment they want? Um, because you know, very few readers um, find challenging material to be attractive or to especially be entertaining. There's, there's a funny article. Thanks for the questions. There's a funny article, uh, I think it was in The Guardian, but it was, it's recent about uh, literature and sort of the complete construction of the concept of literature, right? It's, it's something where people think they're, they're trying to be hand waving, academics do it too, right? Try to be really, really obfuscated about what they mean and rather than have a strong plot, you sort of write in circles. Uh, so I do think it is quite nice that, I mean, this is completely normative and just my personal opinion, I do think it is nice that there is some attention to what readers care about um, and think about. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, in defining uh, the question about in defining avant-garde or indie. Uh, yeah, I'm focused on people who, though, tend to think about literary production as something that's quite autonomous, both economically, but then also from the reader, right? So it's something where you are the avant-garde. You are driving what the literature will look like in the future. You're less going to be less concerned about you know, what the society's gonna say about it now or what people are gonna say about it now. In the future, they'll accept you and legitimate you and understand you. Um, and so it's quite interesting, I think, that these people who tend to, or tended to be, at least theoretically, Bourdieu, Becker, et cetera, uh, tended to be autonomous are now a little bit more interested in what readers have to say. I think that's an interesting development. Yeah. So, first of all, all four of the panelists were absolutely interesting. This is from Thais, though. So when you're talking about Kindle, I think the byproduct of Kindle, which is audible, where you have audio books. So based on what you see in terms of the research, how does something like audible influence content? Because I have Harry Potter at home, but I really want to listen to this guy read Harry Potter. And, oh yeah, while he's reading Harry Potter, I must buy the Kindle book. So you see sort of these auxiliary purchases that are coming up. How do you see that influencing content creators and maybe the industry with these auxiliary products that are influencing the publishing? It's a fa it's a thank you. It's a fascinating question because previously the, the, the author would be concerned about the text as opposed to the sound of the text, but you see more and more authors, especially those who are text savvy, having either the uh, requesting to read their own books. And there's, a re there's usually, when you review a book today, you'll have a review of the book and the audio book, which I find fascinating that you can do both of these things. And you'll have, oh, it's a great book, so sorry about the audio. So in the best case scenario, these will, will uh, cross-fertilize each other and, prevent more, uh, pr and create more revenue. But you have to, all of a sudden you're supposed to be an expert in so many different fields where really you want to be as a writer. And I think that's a, probably a, a a more difficult position, at least. Um, I have a question for Anna Cecilia about feminism and how it's represented in digital media. Um, so it's the 10 year anniversary this year of Feministing, which was in you know, the biggest feminist blog in the feminist blog sphere. Um, and I'm curious about, you, you, you distance yourself from defining feminism, mm -hmm. but how do you think something like hashtag feminism or the weaponized hashtag or milit like the sort of like increasingly identity focused militant feminism mm -hmm. has changed the politics of feminism versus a more stable like just micro generation earlier of mm -hmm. blogs and the creation of actually like long form content and sustained conversation. I actually um, when I was thinking about this idea of what feminism meant within branding and corporations I thought that it was interesting or I kind of said that it made for a bad sell because in fact you can't really boil this down to three bullet points of like this is what this means so you can consume it and buy it. Um, but I find that within 
and you know, within kind of like the feministing or like the feminist blogosphere, um, kind of like what I um, what I mentioned that it, it it does seem to be contestable. That leaves, I think, that makes it all the more attractive for a digital publication to make content around it because it doesn't have a definition. I think they have even, I think, it has even created a more like plurality of of what definition it could be. Like it becomes like, it's like, because they need to make so much content or because they need to create some conversations, it kind of always keeps on commenting and reacting to and redefining itself. And it's, you know, it, it, I don't think it ever kind of will reach, I don't think writing about feminism will ever kind of reach to a more stable mm -hmm. definition. So you think that the, the current digital social media <coughs> sphere is making the term feminism as destable as you're representing? As I think so. Yeah, but at the same time, so there's that's so that's one way that I see it. But also at the same time, like particularly with hashtags, there is kind of this drive to pin down mm -hmm. something that's easily um, that people can easily share, that can have can easily talk about. So it is kind of this this push and pull of both destabilizing it so that it can continue to create commentary, while at the same time making it digestible so like readers will get it and understand it and want to react around it. And, you know, so mm -hmm. it's kind of, I think it's a little bit of both, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess um, if there are no more questions, I have a, oh, go ahead. There's a microphone. Uh, Jill's final thing this year that she's hating me, especially as a denier, art writer and an encyclopedist, actually, because I, I see in our, our uh, social media individuation being very important but not necessarily a subjectivity and subjective experience. And so when you talk to about this divide between you know, political over here, or as if there's a divide, and uh, art criticism over here, it seems to one sort of forget that aesthetics ever happened, that's to say the, the good, or Aristotle, or Kant, or whatever. And, uh, and you see, in my opinion, Art writing is more political than ever, actually, to the extent of thinking about what art is in the first place. And that, you know, just to connect that to the, what we're talking about here, does the specificity of individuation, kind of like you're with the hashtags, play a role in the perpetuating it? Do you mean individuation in terms of authors individuating themselves? And a specific point. So for example, like when one started criticizes this, we can't really be political. Because you can't be political if something is subjective, even if you're a political person. And the same can be said to disinterested thinking about art. If anything you think pieces as you presented them, they didn't have namely thinking. Right. So if I if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's does sort of in Emphasis or desire for individuation? How does that how does that shape sort of writing about <coughs> art? Is that why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting question. I think that's um, I mean, a lot of what I think the sort of think piece economy is driven by is sort of this idea of branding, um, branding a message, branding yourself as having a certain kind of politics and distinguishing yourself from other kinds. Um, so I think that it kind of goes back to a question we were talking about earlier. It's like the, this division between the content of what you're writing about and then also its marketability and those sort of being in tension with one another. Um, how, you know, what's the integrity of the thing that you're writing compared to how you're going to be able to brand it on Twitter or get it shared. Um, and I think that's a big, that's a, that's a big problem. Um, we're out of time. I just want to uh, maybe throw out the question, something to think about. Uh, we can talk about autonomously later. Um, there seems to be this interesting, you know, this panel's about underrepresented voices and sort of connecting to like avant garde communities, but suddenly those communities are quite overwhelming as a, in a way that they've never been before. You know, what, you know, this hyper communication um, that's possible now? How is that creating a hostility toward one's readership? How is that 
readership themselves being like that they are actually the true underrepresented voices and their sort of uh, demand upon like what is shareable for them and the service directly to readers, how is that? you know, transforming our relationship as writers and publishers and editors to readers or as readers ourselves to others. Um, big question, I just came up with that one at the very end. Um, but we're over. So let's all think about that one. Um, thank you all.